uh, my name is Nigel. Um, I work at Accenture um, and I help run our data science center of excellence team. So we have a broad suite of uh, people who do analytics and modeling and various kinds of stuff. Uh, and my team is about eight people and we pretty much take a problem from like inception and needing to be thought about quite extensively to doing the kind of engineering work around it and then delivering some end output whether that's some findings of a report or you know or a model or um, some working code uh, that's kind of what we do we're generally shorter projects um, and relatively um, difficult problems so this is a problem that I got asked to tackle um, about a year ago um, I have a maths background before this, not really in, in image recognition, and the presentation is designed to take somebody from kind of no knowledge of what computer vision is up to a pretty decent understanding of where things are now, um, and I'll try and get through it in 45 minutes. Um, so we'll start with a basic problem, which is kind of identifying people and find where they are in an image, um, tracking them through multiple image sequences. Um, then we'll go and talk about improving accuracy. Um, so the pr approaches I'll start with are kind of these really classical approaches that have been done for about 20, 30 years. Um, but more recently, there's been a lot of advancements in neural networks, uh, which I'll talk about in detail in the second half. Um, and then I'll talk about what's next, because there's some really interesting research going on all the time in image recognition. When I was running this project, uh, a new technique came out that literally as we were in sort of like the second week where we were like, we want to use that technique. Um, we want to use their models and their um, stuff from their paper. So. Um, and then even since uh, I put this presentation together, there's been some stuff that I'll touch on at the end. So um, we'll start with the finding people problem. And if you take a grocery store, um, kind of, I guess, guesses w what the project was on, um, we want to count the number of people who enter into that grocery store. And what you might have is in a frame, you want to draw some useful information around. So the image on the right, you'll notice there's a green outline around that person just entering the door. That's useful information for you if you want to count them or track the number of people, see where they, where they hang around in the store, um, and maybe even observe you know, uh, how long they, um, they spend in the store and that kind of behavior. So the process we'll go with is really simple, and it's just called background subtraction with contouring. Background subtraction is literally the process of kind of averaging lots of images and figuring out what the base background is and then just taking that background away from another image. So a quick example of how to do that would be using uh, NumPy Pandas and OpenCV. OpenCV is called uh, Open Computer Vision and it's a really big library for doing uh, many different kinds of image operation. It's quite weighty and there are more efficient ones for other things but OpenCV covers lots of bases with the kind of capabilities it has in it. Um, so if you imagine, what we might do is we might have this kind of empty store, which is our background subtractor, or, uh, which is our background, and we initialize a subtractor, and we take away kind of the current frame of a video from it. And you end up with this ghostly image on the right, which is basically kind of the pixel difference between the empty store and the store with somebody in it. And that's, and it's nothing more than that. It doesn't tell you that this is a person. It doesn't tell you that there's some, you know, any, uh, a dog or a cat or some items in the shop. And you'll notice that it's particularly noisy as well. Um, images from video are inherently noisy. Um, they contain things like heat distortions um, uh, from, um, uh, say, a refrigerator emitting heat will cause uh, these kind of, you know, pixel values to change. So you just end up, when you take one image away from another, you end up with some inherent noise in there. But there's probably enough information in that, uh, in that image to at least recognize there's two people, at least. And that's kind of the information that we need to, to make progress. Um, there is, as I said, the result's messy. Um, and there's even some kind of you know, weird computer screen thing on the left that we don't care about. What we can do is um, we can do a process called opening, which um, if you imagine, it's kind of like sieving, where you uh, effectively you just lose pixels that are really small and on their own. And, you, uh, and what that results in is you kind of remove a lot of the noise, but you also take away a little bit of the edges of some of the big uh, shapes. Um, that process is really useful for because what you don't want is lots of noise in your image. Um, you want large, uh, usually you want kind of large approximations of where people are. And again, this is a really old technique. This isn't like something new or particularly interesting. 
Um, this is just something that's very tried and tested and, and used kind of a lot in the security industry for motion activated security cameras and that kind of thing. Um, the other part is basically combining the, the same two processes that we used on the other side of opening, but, but doing it the other way around. And, and the sieve metaphor kind of doesn't work that way around. But um, effectively, uh, if you look at the image on the left, um, you'll see that, say, it's, um, uh, it's got a lot of thin and kind of wispy detail around the, the woman's arms. And on the image on the right, what's happened is it's actually kind of filled in some of those wispy details around the neckline and the, the other image. And what that's done is it's just resulted in a um, again, a more cohesive shape. Because what I'm really after is a blob that the computer can draw around rather than something with holes and, and, and fuzzy edges. We can do it again with kind of changing the size of the coarsity of the sieve effectively. Um, and that just results in a slightly different, different case. Now, if I was going to spend loads of time on this, I'd work on it until I didn't have any noise. Because you can see the last process has uh, brought through a lot of noise. Um, but that's kind of an example of you know, when you don't necessarily do it quite right. In a really well-tuned example with um, a really well-initiated background subtractor, um, the background subtractor has to be something you average over time and it's kind of quite a manual process to, to get it set up. Um, you, you could, effectively, how you construct that background subtractor can have a large impact on what this ends up looking like. So effectively, the process that happened um, kind of three or four slides ago uh, was very um, kind of just rudimentary at best. Um, and, and when if you were doing this properly in a production scenario or you know in a more commercial scenario, you would spend a lot more time working on that initial background subtractor and all of the um, conditions around getting it set up. So we're going to move on. And eventually, we end up with this kind of shape. And from there, what you can say is just draw, around, draw polygons around the largest shapes for me. Um, so from there, you can end up with a nice draw image uh, of a green line around the interesting shapes of the person by the door. So by those simple bits of maths of taking one image away from another um, and doing some various processing to um, reduce the, you know, the grains of sand and maybe um, make sure you've got a singular large blob, you can end up with the useful information I was talking about on the um, you know, third slide. So that's the real basics of tracking somebody or finding somebody in a singular image. Um, and you can generalize it by uh, effectively doing multiple frames and then um, just kind of doing some basic vector tracking which, uh, of where the, those frame, where those polygons go from, each, from one frame to another. Um, again, very straightforward um, and prone to errors as well. So really prone to errors when two people overlap, quite obvious, because what happens is the process ends up making a really large blob instead of two distinct blobs. So you have to have some quite careful logic in there around making sure that you don't suddenly turn two people into one and then one into two again, um, which can very easily happen with this approach. But it's pr if you have enough cameras in the right places, it's perfectly adequate to get you where you need to go. Um, but the problem is it doesn't actually tell you anything about the type of thing that it's seeing. So you don't know whether a large blob is a person or a shadow or you know, a car. It doesn't, you can't tell the difference between a car and a person, which is a really common use case or common scenario. Um, what you really want is something that looks like this, where each individual thing is actually recognized and um, localized on the image and then labeled with the, f the class that it thinks it is. So in this case, it's recognized the tie and the you know, umbrellas and people. Um, and it's recognized them f uh, in very in uh, situations where there's occlusion. So on the left-hand side, you know, where the shoulder is basically occluding most of the person's body. Um, it's recognizing you know, the umbrella, even though it's misty. Um, there's no way you could get to this with the subtraction I talked about before. You know, this is something a class entirely different. So um, there, are there are a few different classes of problems. Um, these are uh, kind of the ones I'll focus on for now. Um, there's the classification, which is literally just showing it an image and, and just saying there's a hot dog in it. There's identifying where on that image the hot dog is. There's drawing a polygon around where um, you think, like, or drawing a square around um, the multiple objects within the same image. So rather than just choosing the best, like the, the most obvious class in that image, you actually draw all the different types of things. That's generally classed as a detection problem. 
and then there's the drawing polygons around stuff. Um, now the instant segmentation part, that's one of the thing, the kind of holy grail stuff of self-driving car technology, and it's actually a really slow process. So the the to do um, this, this can actually run at about 60 to 90 frames a second on a Titan X GPU, which is kind of the latest graphics card from NVIDIA. Um, whereas, uh, and that basically means it's real time and faster than humans can do at, uh, at an 80% accuracy. But for the segmentation problem, which is inherently useful for some of those you know, self-driving technologies, um, this process is really slow. Um, it mo I think the, the it's, you're talking about like kind of I think it's 1.6 frames a second is the very best that you can get in the moment, which looks really it's just you know really choppy obviously for humans to see, and in me and that's kind of one of the um, kind of main. Uh, just processing power is kind of holding back a load of use cases. Um, and when that happens, and also the techniques are holding back some of the use cases you could do if you could draw around different types of objects. Because then if you could do that, you could do have things like you know, um, mid-air interception of objects by a computer. Whereas if you're only getting 1.6 frames a second of um, image segmentation, drawing polygons around an image, you're never going to be able to have a machine intercept some, something in real time really accurately. Um, you can get that pretty close, but you're not going to get r that real high precision accuracy. Um, and this section is all about accuracy. So I'm going to talk about how you measure accuracy. Um, principally, uh, I uh, how many people are comfortable with precision and recall? Hands up for precision and recall. OK, yeah, so precision is like um, how, when, how often do you say something is a hot dog, um, you're usually right about it. And the recall is, um, can you identify most of the hot dogs in the population? So they measure different metrics. Um, the, one of the metrics that's commonly used is um, an F2 score. So a lot of people are familiar with F1. An F2 score um, is basically the harmonic mean of, um, um, of kind of like the of this derivative of the F1 score. And what it does is it, um, it weights precision uh, more highly than recall, um, which for image classification problems is usually a preferred thing because actually if you have a little bit of error in your, um, like in your, um, re if you have more error in your precision, it's generally seen by humans as worse in these kind of scenarios. So F2 kind of relates um, more to just the way humans perceive something to be good in this scenario. Um, but the problem with these is they're really, really good for judging classification problems, but they, tell you not, uh, they don't tell you when shapes overlap or how accurate you are with your localization. So a really common metric to use for classifying when uh, sh the localization has worked correctly is something called jacquard distance or intersection over union. And that basically measures how closely two sets overlap and I, if you do it for polygons, how closely those, sh those polygons overlap. Um, and this is a really interesting one because as a metric, um, it actually it really heavily penalizes um, I inaccuracy. Um, so sometimes you might see something that a computer, uh, a kind of uh, an intersection over union that a computer has done, and you might say, well, that's a really amazing polygon that it's drawn around that, you know, the, I don't know, the piece of cake in that image, and yet um, it'll have a really bad um, intersection of union score because of the dithering around the edges of the polygons, and that's kind of quite heavily penalized. Um, so it's kind of an interesting metric because um, even a 60% intersection of union can look quite good to a human, um, you know, whereas in the other ones you need, you know, you need to like 95% for them to be like a considered human scale um, quality of drawing. Um, so how do we get, get this? Um, and I'll do a, a um, uh, intro to kind of neural networks um, in a way that hopefully will be understandable. Um, so if you think about the, the inherent um, logic through all of this presentation is that images are ultimately numbers underneath, um, red, green, red, green and blue values, or black and white in this case. Um, those pixel intensities convey information that we can then use to, to try and figure out what is in the image. Um, so I'm going to go into um, neural networks and then I'll discuss kind of types of neural networks later. Um, so if you imagine passing every pixel value kind of just like linearly through um, a series of weighted uh, equations uh, and then passing it through what we call an activation function, which effectively just um, imagine if something's ne if, if that the weight um, takes you over a certain value, it might trigger the activation function. Um, or if the weight takes you over, you know, it might do it smoothly or it might do it like non-linearly. Um, to think about that in more simple terms, what you're really doing is um, effectively 
um, the weights. Initially, usually they're pre-randomized, um, uh, and then you kind of have uh, a, pro a process that tries to guess the weights. Um, you add um, you add a, a beta on the term and uh, just to um, is like, kind of like a slack variable, I guess you could call it. So the it's usually done by um, best kind of via an example. So if you imagine, and this is kind of just from the TensorFlow example. So there's the good stuff. The good thing with um, all of this, um, the stuff I'm doing here is there's loads of material online for it. There's loads of material on from you know Google and um, Facebook and academic research papers. The and this is literally this is literally the kind of TensorFlow 101 basic example of how to learn a neural network. Um, if we were trying to predict three class labels of just seven, eight, or nine, um, we ultimately want the probability to look basically to trigger when, when and trigger for the class eight. So it gets the label of eight correct. Um, we measure accuracy um, in this case via a metric called um, cross entropy. Um, this function is really important um, depending on the type of problem you're trying to solve. Um, cross entropy is like quite a good way place to start, but there's more you can do with it if you're solving different kinds of problem. Um, but we'll stick with that. So, uh, so we basically what we're saying is we're comparing a labeled accuracy, which is our ground truth, um, with what the network thinks the label should be. So we say in this case, the network says you've got 0.9 for class 2, and the ground truth is it's actually 1 for class 2. And we want a way of kind of uh, basically encourage doing that class of the machine learning, i.e. we want a way of uh, kind of the machine to try and improve its accuracy of predicting class 8. So um, what you do is you use a, you effectively run a series of iterations, which is generally known as epochs, to try and um, improve that accuracy metric. And so when people talk about like this, um, the machine learning of a neural network, in my head, this is kind of the main step of that learning, where effectively every time you're trying to um, improve your error loss, or um, I decrease your, your error score, and, um, and, and therefore you're, it's kind of improving itself and improving its model as it goes along. So that series of weights, um, in, if you uh, look online, often you can actually download that series of weights. And those are literally just you know, numbers that initially started as random and via this process of scoring the accuracy and then um, trying to optimize that loss um, has become more and more accurate at predicting the classes. Um, and the weights are usually quite um, uh, quite sizable in terms of how, uh, like their you know their megabytes or gigabytes that they take up. Just because they're, um, if you imagine this is a two layers, you can add more and more layers. And what you end up what ends up happening is um, you end up kind of being uh, able to identify higher, more and more higher level features. Usually, the deeper your network goes. So whilst initially you might have simple patterns, eventually you end up with eyes, eventually you end up with faces, eventually you end up with you know, scenes and landscapes and everything else. Um, and just sometimes these things are the, the initial step there. Um, they're similar to Gabian filters, or they are Gabian filters, which are kind of um, the rods and cones. The reason this is interesting is because um, some of the basic pattern detection your brain does uses Gabian filters, which are kind of these um, very straightforward, kind of like gradient fill type. Uh, if you imagine the kind of PowerPoint background gradient fill things, where you've kind of got like um, a circle with different radiating different colors, or like a diagonal line with one color on the side in different gradients, you, that's kind of analogous to what a Gabian filter is. And you can combine different Gabian filters to end up with more and more complex patterns. Um, from there, um, so that you uh, d can actually recognize multiple classes within an image and to make the processing and kind of transformations more easy, um, there's this convolution step, which is literally the process of just kind of m um, jumping around the image um, to try and find, uh, to basically only pass through smaller sections of it. The interesting thing with convolutional neural networks is they uh, initially where there's a guy called Jan LeCun who kind of wrote the initial paper on them. And he uh, initially they weren't used, um, they weren't kind of seized upon straight away. But they, um, they're, they're, there have been various kind of um, competitions to try and improve the performance of image classification tasks. And these have kind of just come out as the, the model of choice for those problems. Um, so you do it for every tie, and you output, uh, uh, and then effectively you just kind of keep doing more and more <coughs> layers of the neural network. So there are the thing with neural networks, and this is kind of one of the 
the astonishing thing that uh, me and my team found when we were learning them is you can kind of keep going deeper and deeper in your understanding of them. Um, uh, so you can keep learning more about different network architectures that solve different problems better. You can keep um, kind of changing and tweaking settings um, to try and improve performance. Um, and it's definitely at the point where I, there's, if you read kind of the literature, I think it's definitely more kind of art than science in terms of how people are choosing the network architectures because it kind of just often it feels like someone's taken a punt on a different approach and um, that approach has you know, worked miraculously for a certain type of problem. Um, rather than because the computation takes so much effort, it definitely feels like people aren't necessarily um, doing so many uh, uh, kind of comparisons of different models when they're writing their papers. You get that kind of um, comparison when the big competitions run or when people publish different types of model. There's a you know, ranking of accuracy and other stuff uh, and other kind of metrics. But for on a kind of paper by paper basis, it very much seems as people are just like really creatively trying different um, ways of improving their performance for very specific different problems. So one of the things you can do is change the network architecture. So initially we talked about you know, a, a one layer network. We've added and then we moved on to a three layer network. Um, well, people have kind of gone crazy with it and just gone to like you know, 20, 30 layer deep networks with all sorts of different functions on them. Um, the UNet one is interesting because um, this is, if you see it's kind of unbalanced, you know, one step goes kind of straight to the end as it were and then you've got these other steps that kind of go deeper and then back up. That's really, really good for the image segmentation problems. So um, if you look at, the, um, for example, if you're a map provider and you want to trace over maps, um, so say where's the grass, where are the roads, where are the water, um, the, if you look at the latest category competitions, it'll be UNets that generally will, UNet-like architectures that win those problems. So for instant segmentation problems, they're really good. The problem is they're very slow to run. Like they're not real time. Uh, they're not able to solve real time problems or uh, do it quickly enough to be semi real time. Um, the one that's really cool and was kind of that the Daniel Craig James Bond example I gave was um, YOLO, um, which stands for You Only Look Once, and is a really cool um, model that's all fully open source. Um, you can even download pre-trained versions of the model. It runs really fast, uh, and it does. It can do 9,000 different classes of objects um, in 60 frames a second, which when it at about 78% accuracy, and what that means is it pretty much runs faster than your eye can see stuff, which is pretty crazy when you see it working um, fast. There's YouTube videos and lots of demos of it online as well, which I'd encourage you to go and look at because it's kind of crazy. Um, now, there's one other piece of thing you can do with network architecture, with the network architecture, and this is this has kind of been around for a while, but it's quite new in terms of people applying it, um, which is called like defined by run neural networks. So. If you imagine the defined AND run is what the vast majority of neural nets are, and that's where they um, you effectively spell out what the um, network looks like, and then you just say iterate over it, just do more of that. Um, defined by run basically um, kind of allows the computer to just change the network as it goes, dependent on set criteria. So um, you might have effectively different layers drop out or different things change as they. Um, uh, as time goes on. The defined by run is very interesting because it solves NLP problems quite well. Um, a lot of the new natural language processing um, approaches kind of that use CNNs will use a defined by run network. Um, that's usually more, it's more the case um, than say some of the image recognition problems which is quite interesting. So clearly there's something about defined by run that makes them um, more performant generally at NLP problems for, on an accuracy basis. Um, and then there's tons more stuff. So you can modify the activation functions. So um, those activation functions, uh, they're really important. They, um, they kind of uh, basically just act to speed up the learning rate by effectively making a decision when the weights, um, when the weights happen. So effectively, um, by they, kind of, uh, they act to basically just speed up the process um, of the weights and the, the learning algorithm um, happening. A lot of networks, yeah, they, there's like sigmoid is really popular, like rectified linear units are really popular. Um, and often these are various different activation functions will be combined in the same network at different points um, to, because they have kind of various advantages at different stages of the type, kind of features you're trying to do. So sometimes, imagine you're doing the face example. Sometimes you might say what for, a, if you're trying to detect an eye, you might want, um, say, a sigmoid, which has like a really smooth um, curve. If you're doing, if you're trying to say whether somebody is the same person or not, maybe you want like a rectified linear unit one because it's going to make a very um, uh, uh, non-linear decision. Um, you can change the, your learning rates. Um, if you imagine the kind of um, 
if the that saddle graph and a color for one as um, effectively like the optimal solutions, you can like alter your learning rate to get to a m roughly accurate solution much quicker, for example. Um, max pooling is probably the, other, the most important other step um, you need to know, which is basically the process of just summing up pixels. Um, and it's a way of really speeding up the processing time. Um, all of this stuff is like a real trade-off between accuracy and performance. Um, and max pooling and pooling of any form is like effectively a performance improvement method. Um, yeah. Other things to do with like early stopping if it's clearly looking like an unsatisfactory learning approach. Um, bagging for effectively just trying to um, summarize results quickly. Again, these are all methods of performance tuning. Some of them have, they have uh, accuracy trade-offs, but those trade-offs are usually deemed to be worth it. Um, and then dropout. So this is one of the things that a um, that defined by run neural network does really well. Um, effectively being able to customize your dropout, so kind of just not running stuff by certain neurons, uh, is a it, it can substantially improve performance over the long term because you're basically just having to do less graph traversals. Um, and defined by run is uh, um, if you imagine. Uh, then you don't usually want to be too static with, your, with which things you choose to drop out from your network. Um, so I think this is why it works better for, this is kind of my hypothesis of why defined by run networks work better for NLP problems, um, because effectively you're, you're allowing the kind of graph to adapt uh, for many different types of solutions. Um, whereas in image recognition, you're going to see like similar patterns. I've probably not explained that very super well, but dropouts are super useful, I think, as well to do in most networks. So a quick example of um, you know, training a net would be um, there's a great library called TFLearn for learning TensorFlow. Um, TensorFlow is Google's library for um, doing uh, image recognition or specifically tensor calculations, but it's like predominantly used for um, a lot and most of their models. Um, you can import TensorFlow Learn. You can, you, the key part is to have a set of images and then a set of labels. Um, so all the data sets that you'll get for um, this kind of problem will have a set of images, and sometimes for the segmentation ones, you'll have a label and you know some coordinates for where those um, where the polygons are for when you're drawing around stuff in an image, um, and maybe you'll have so therefore maybe you'll have like a separate um, another data set. So you might have an X, Y, and Z, but in general, you'll have like X and Y classes for images and labels. You import those, and you do a little bit of pre-processing. Um, that bottom section there, the network building, is basically where you define that network design. Um, you're basically just defining inputs and outputs um, and defining what kind of operation you're trying to run. And then eventually you train a sort of really simplistic model that um, classifies. And this, this is just designed to run really. This one I have an example here is designed to run really quickly. It's not intended to be accurate. But effectively, all you've got is um, you, know, you input your libraries, you input your data sets. You do some image pre-processing. Um, there's some really important stuff about like color correction. So, um, you know, images can be shot in various different lighting conditions, and so normalizing for those lighting conditions can be really important. And then you um, maybe you might, one of the things that can be quite useful in a, um, is to say add a bit of randomization to your training data um, within certain bounds, so, and that allows you to effectively kind of just have a more diverse training set for your um, when you actually plug it through a model. Um, that data augmentation piece is the focus of like a lot of work and research um, because it's quite interesting the fact that you can like add noise and it still kind of helps out the network. Um, the image, the data augmentation part is also the source of some of the really interesting work that I think I'll, I'll talk about at the end about what's next. Um, and then you just run the network, right? You just trigger it, set it off, and let it go. So if we focus back, just um, and I've covered these kind of in my in my conversation, it's like the first three problems are actually in a I'd, I'd argue like a pretty decent state from like a timeliness and accuracy point of view. There is a lot of work that can still be done to get the accuracy up to human levels, um, but there's um, you know they're relatively fast. The segmentation problem is just slow, um, and kind of there's it seems like there's a lot of work to do in that area, um, and it's generally reserved to uh, some you know processes that can be offline like drawing around maps or. Um, kind of um, post-event analysis, for example. So, you know, the problem is this. Um, one of the real advantages with the field is that 
authors share their um, neural networks and one of the real trends is someone will share the paper, they'll share the data and they'll share pre-trained models. That, so you basically you can kind of enter into the process at any step you want, right? You can enter it into the theoretical step, you can enter it at the trying to train your own model on their data, um, or you can enter it at the they've already built a model that you can go and pre like reuse immediately um, for whatever you want. Um, and that last step is actually something that we um, we find really advantageous because um, if you want to, for, so it basically required no work to get to the work, the image, or the the solution on the right. So all of that, you know, previous work that would take a lot of time, because somebody's pre-trained the network and given you the the weight, those weights um, and the classes, you can get to the results really quickly. Usually they're published under um, pretty generous licenses. Um, either like fully open. This is what this one is done with. I think basically a license that says do whatever you want with it. Um, some of them are, are published under like you know MIT or uh, various other kinds of pretty generous licenses. Um, and then you know this is another one like you know why don't you train your own model? Um, people there's a guy in Israel called Tal Hasner who takes that same approach of you know paper code data and pre-trained models. So he literally even releases his code for a P, um, for you to use usually for research, but um, you know, he's, they've released something which estimates gender accurately like 86% of the time. Um, that's a pretty in incredible accuracy for having to do effectively no work you know, from scratch. Um, and the same for age as well. Um, age is a little bit um, worse, but it's still pretty incredible, I think, that you can go online and procure the, and get these things really easily, like free and openly, and contribute back to the research as well. Um, so, for example, when we were doing this project, um, I found a bug in one of the um, uh, the TensorFlow implementation of um, YOLO, and I made, raised a pull request, and it got like just merged re um, within th an hour into the library by people because that's kind of how collaborative the image recognition community is, um, and how receptive they were to like um, certain types of fixes and improvements. So, um, in terms of what's next, um, I think this is this is uh, all stuff that came out about um, within the last three months. Um, the one on the top left is by a student call, um, called Carl Vondrick. Um, he's, I think he's a PhD or postdoc at MIT. And it's all about predicting what the future of, uh, and generating what the future of uh, image sequence might look like. So in this scenario, the green frames are effectively what the computer sees, and the red frames are what the computer generates. Uh, and so you can see, like, it kind of gets trained with that, um, with that initial, um, just somebody kind of going to throw a basketball, but uh, sort of going through a baseball, but it doesn't know what happens next. Um, their approach is actually on the the kind of top left image. That's actually their prediction. So the red is all predicted and generated from that initial um, image, a set of images. Um, the previous best approach is in the middle, and then a very kind of basic optical flow, which is just kind of um, taking the, the vectors that were from the underlying video and kind of just playing them out into the future. Um, so LSTMs are really popular for, pattern, for image sequences and pattern detection and pass well, pattern classification. Um, and their approach achieves kind of this unbelievably freaky superhuman um, way of, predict of generating and predicting images into the future. They, the re reason I really like that paper is because they take a really novel approach to data collection. So they basically downloaded lots of YouTube videos that were all unlabeled, um, and they ran them through um, the kind of most accurate um, image classifiers, and then they used that to train up their um, their sequence classifier. And so I thought it was, I really like it because it's a really novel approach to kind of the problem of not having enough data, um, and kind of a bit meta as to kind of you know using a image recon recognizer to train up a sequence classifier. Um, and the results are super impressive. And he's, always, he's a really great person to follow on Twitter. His name's Carl Vondrick. He's always tweeting just like, it's like 100% quality. Like, um, it's really nice to just, <laughs> just to get, you know, you see this thing pop through and you're like, that's awesome to, 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 list, to read and, and follow. Um, the deeper line representations, I think, is also one of his, his works where they've basically proven that by um, a specific um, unit within the neural network is activated um, for when it receives, say, the sound of a swimming pool, an image of a swimming pool, or the text describing a swimming pool, um, which, if you think about the kind of generalized learning stuff, is quite a major advancement because it means that effectively it has reached a general, the network has generalized enough to know that um, it has this abstract concept of a swimming pool, which is triggered by different types of data.
Um, and I, so I, that's kind of like one of those things where um, you could imagine, I know, layering in, say, more movement data from uh, from a robot, and maybe eventually you might end up with it knowing what swimming feels like, for example, as the same hidden unit. I'm using in like anthropomorphic terms, which probably doesn't help, but um, you know, the same unit would be activated for, say, swimming and swimming pool or that kind of stuff. So it's kind of like a, a more generalized version of the network. Um, the dexterity network is super cool again on the image, um, uh, uh, but on the data collection side of stuff. So they, um, they uh, this is from researchers at Berkeley. They um, generated 3D um, shapes uh, that they that basically never existed, or they, they basically just um, uh, made 3D models. I think they made about 6.7 million 3D models. And then they trained this um, network to try and optimize the grips that it would take, i.e. if you had a, a robotic arm, it optimized like how it would grip the objects. But it obviously it did that without ever knowing the physical world. It did it only on the, like, the 3D generated objects. And when they trained it on a thousand unseen object types in the real world, it had like 99% um, accuracy for picking up objects. So it basically only dropped like well, I think one, uh, one object. Um, because it always figured out the optimum um, pose with which to pick up the objects. And I love that approach again of just like, it's not like the YouTube approach of using a classifier, but it's still being really creative with the data generation and the, the, the data collection approach. Um, some of the kind of cla um, the um, original researchers on neural nets have made a lot of um, uh, work, uh, done a lot of work on uh, kind of the uh, what do you call it, the understandability of neural nets, which is that bottom left-hand one. So just trying to figure out what it has learned as a representation or what it has abstracted as a representation of an object. So when people talk about that kind of, um, I think or whenever some people talk about like, you know, what has it learned and we need to understand it more, like we don't want it to be a black box, that's one of the papers that's really gone down that route um, from a very technical angle. Um, and then this other one is something that literally came out like I don't know, a few in the last week, um, which is pretty, it is kind of absurd, where it basically takes a 2D image of an object and tries to give you a 3D reconstruction of what it is. Um, it's, uh, it's so on the surface of it, it seems kind of very straightforward, but if you think about it, it has to have learned like how a 2D is shape and a 3D shape, effectively, like what the kind of mapping might be between them, um, and therefore be able to kind of um, do the transformation um, accurately from a 2D picture of a chair to a roughly 3D model of that chair. Um, and there's more, even more examples of you know, and, you know, it's not just types, it's like types of chair. It's not just a chair and a car, it's like types of different car, like a pickup or, a, um, or an estate car, or um, types of aeroplane, like you know, a, big, a big aeroplane or a, a prop or something smaller. So these are all kind of these insights into the research that's going on and kind of little uh, insights into, you know, you can imagine the dexterity network on a production line or picking, you can imagine the um, generating the future um, the generating the future one's really funny because it's like um, uh, it's done like sliding doors. So they say they make the example that the future is inherently uncertain. So they do some really clever stuff about actually picking the most um, certain future ver future versions of situations. Um, rather, than, so it's like it's not just picking the average future scenario. It's picking like it's saying well, there's like three or four or however many different scenarios that could play out, and then trying to give you the most probable scenario in that from that image. But then one of the things we were, I was asked by um, a client that I was working on was basically for like Minority Report-esque, can you predict the future of, um, can you predict when there are going to be accidents like in a, in a retail environment, you know, like a slippage or, a, or basically a health and safety type incident. And so I was like, that's a really hard problem. <laughs> I'll go away and research it. And the very best you're going to get is kind of a rough generated version of the future about a second in advance. Um, or unless you take a different approach, but again, like you, the accuracy falls off so quickly that it's just not there yet as a way of solving the problem. So that pretty much concludes my talk. Um, thank you very much for having me.